Hello. I'd like to introduce you to Simon Penney, author of this incredible book, Breaking Good. Simon, it's so lovely to meet you, even though it's just virtual. This is amazing. And thank you, thank you so much for writing this story that needed to be told and needs to be read. Lovely to meet you, Heather. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure you don't need any, uh, any introduction. Um, Heather Morris of the, um, the, 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 the very famous Heather Morris author. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, look, we both have the same wonderful publishers and it's just wonderful that they put the two of us together and, and we get to have a chat about well, our stories and uh, yeah, how they're out there in the big wide world now. And uh, this is really, really good stuff for me. Now, listen, hey, the first thing I wanted to ask you, which is um, not really a story about your book per se, but it, what was it like working with a ghostwriter? I, I've just often wondered what it was like having somebody else writing your words. Um, I, I actually really enjoyed working with Neil. Um, he, he really got into my story. He, he, he really relived my life. In actual fact, there was a, a lot of times after we, we did recordings where I had left our meetings and, and I really felt sorry for him because I could tell that he, he felt disturbed. After after listening to some of the things that he that he heard, yeah. I mean, how long did you sort of have a chat to him and get to know him before you agreed? Oh yeah, listen, we've got a connection here, and and we can do this. Um, I, I think I think we spoke for about twelve months prior. Uh, we did a little introduction, so we did a little a little book uh, called Dollars and Cents, uh, which was all about social enterprise. Um, okay. And he did a little, a little story on, on fruit to work um, and a little article on me um, and, and really liked my story. And that's where, that's where Breaking Good took off. Oh, I get it. Well, that makes sense. And, you know, we'll come back to, um, you know, fruit to work and social enterprise because I think that's such a pivotal part of, you know, who you are now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess really it's the story. It's the book. It's your life that led to it being written and told the way it was and truly amazing and wow that um that you could be so honest you're so brutally honest and that's what I loved about it you know, you're not sort of sucking up to anybody you're not trying to pretend that you and your existence was something other than it was and hey congratulations mate you nailed it thank you and thank you the, the, the idea of the book was to uh to, to, to let people know that I, that I made mistakes, um, and, but also that I, that I learned from those mistakes. So, you, you know, I, I treated those, those mistakes as lessons. Um, yeah. and, and maybe, maybe those lessons can, can also help many other people go through, through the same sort of issues that I went through. Oh, look, I'm sure of it. Of course they will. Um, yeah, that, that whole coming from a successful background with not only family, a beautiful, loving family, and success in sporting and in business. And uh, just that one incident, that one accident that made all the difference and turned you from being the person that you were into this other person. Well, that can happen to anybody, can't it? It can just takes one thing. Ne never in a million years did I see my life go, go in the way it did. You know, really, up until that workplace accident, Apart from apart from my father dying at at, at an early age, but yeah. but, but um, before that workplace accident, everything I touched really turned to gold. Mm. Um, you know, from being fit as a fiddle to owning a beautiful home, driving a Mercedes Benz, riding a Harley Davidson. You know, I, I had the, the the white picket fence dream, yeah. um, and then being put in a wheelchair in in chronic pain twenty four hours a day and no relief. So. Mm. You know, I, 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 I did anything I could to get away from that pain and ice, ice did the trick. Yeah. Do you think there was a failing of our health system that kind of led to that too and not, not supporting you the way it should have or could have? Well, I, I, I don't know about a failing in the health system. Um, yeah, I, look, it could be a combination of things. It, 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 it could be anything from... From the, the people that, that I worked with, 
it could be an OHS issue. Uh, there was, was a number of, of failures. There was a number of failures there. Um, but most of all, I, I made the choice to take ice. Nobody forced me to take ice. So, you know, I, I'm the one to blame. And that's what I love about your book, that um, that whole word blame, that, gosh, we want to use it all the time, don't we? We need, we need to blame somebody else for our lot in life when really we shouldn't because that's such a negative and you'll never climb out of it if you just keep blaming. And that was the beauty of your book. You owned your own mistakes and uh, did what you could to come out of them and yeah you slip back a few times but who doesn't who's had the perfect life nobody yeah my, my life became far from perfect especially when once i started using ice my, it went from using a hundred dollars a day to to using a thousand dollars a day and then i had to work out how i was going to pay for that habit now yeah. in, in the drug world you either deal drugs or you steal to to pay for that habit and, and i chose to deal drugs and that comes with a whole new world of, of uh, a whole new world I hadn't imagined. So I, I started dealing with unsavory characters, you know, that's where I found myself shot and, and, and stabbed and, and, and that's where I nearly died, you know? And, and along the way, I just kept using more and more drugs, masking, masking my pain. I, you know, I'd lost my father, my brother, my mother and my baby daughter and, 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 um, I just use more and more and more ice, you know, to, to mask that pain. Uh, in, in the lowest parts of my life, I, I have five suicide attempts. And, and had, I, had I have succeeded today, I would have been very sorry because my life is good today. Yeah, and, and you own it. You own all those, those mistakes and those attempts. Hey, listen, can I say we've actually got, well, it's not in common in the same sort of sense, but the loss of your baby uh, my goodness, did that ever hit me like a ton of bricks. And uh, my life prior to quitting work to write was in a hospital here in Melbourne in the social work department. And one of the things I did for, gosh, nearly 20 years, I was involved with parents in this hospital weekly whose babies didn't survive. That's what I did for a living for 20 years. Wow. And um, I have seen so many times the, the pain of losing a baby. There is no other pain like it. Um, I imagine you would agree with me. Your parents, yes, and your brother, and, and adults is one thing, but um, a newborn is, yeah. And yeah, I have lived that pain through the eyes of many, 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 many others. I, I really could accept the fact that I lost my father and my mother and, and, and even my brother at the age of 48. But to lose a new life, a new light, new hope, you know, to carry, um, to carry that little pink coffin and, and place her in, in the ground. And, you know, I, I, that was also a big shock was when, when I picked up her coffin, when we walked down to, to grab, to, 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 to carry her coffin, it was on the back seat of the limousine. Like it wasn't even in a proper hearse, you, you know, that was another shock in itself. Yeah, and nobody prepared you. That's really, really bad. You should have been prepared for that. Um, because, yes, it's just shock on shock on shock. And, uh, yeah, how many pits can you take in one day? It, 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 was, a lot, it was a lot to take hold of. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, the, the drugs just masked everything even more and more and more. Um, to the point where I, I'd had enough and, and, and I really wanted to die. Mm. And, and that's one thing about writing the book. Um, which I, I really didn't expect. So, yeah. so sp speaking to, to Neil, um, I honestly thought that every time I tried to suicide in the five times that I really wanted to die. But, but whilst writing the book, I realised that maybe that wasn't the case every single time. I think, I know, I know for a fact at least twice, that was definitely the case. But... I, I come to realise that maybe three of those times was was you know um, a toss between a cry for help and 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 wanting to die. Yeah, and look once again, I can um, relate to that because of the man Lali Sokolov, whose story the the tattooist of Auschwitz is about. You know, I met him only a matter of weeks after his wife had died, 
and they'd been together for over 60 years. For him, when the first day I met him, the, he said the words to me, you know, hurry up and tell my story because I need to be with Gita. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, every time I saw him, which was two to three times a week, he said those same words to me, have you finished my book yet? And I go, no, Lali, well, hurry up. I need to be with Gita. And it was when, and he told, he told his son, I don't intend to be long in this, this world. I don't want to be here. I want to be dead um, with Gita. And it was only when he started telling his story and he got to know me and started to really, really yeah, share and, and debrief all of those incredibly painful events of the Holocaust that he'd survived. That you know, one day he greeted me with, have you finished my book yet? And when I said, no, Lully, he never followed it up with, I need to be with Gita. And I knew he'd turned the tide, the tide at that point. And he now wanted to live. And we had another you know, two and a half years together. So, and that was because, in, in, in my mind, is because he, he didn't feel like he belonged anymore. Yeah. And, and because my family died, I felt like I didn't belong. I didn't belong anymore, even though I still had children and an ex-wife and a still a brother. I, I didn't feel like I had a a family anymore. It was I was lost. It was terrible. It was it was, it was really a terrible time. It took me a very long time to accept the fact that I had lost those family members and it really took me a long time to appreciate the family I still had left. And, uh, and that's what happened when I, when I went to jail, actually. I, you know, when those chemicals start to regenerate in your brain um, mm. under, under 23 hours of lockdown, so compulsory rehabilitation, um, I, I started to actually appreciate for the first time ever the family I still had left and I stopped feeling sorry for myself about the family that I had lost. Yeah, but you also made the most of your time inside. You, you didn't just uh, lie or spend your time in, in your cell on your own. You studied, you learned, you clearly there was something there still driving you for when I get out of here. I hope I can have um, a better life when I get out of here. I'm going to work towards that. Uh, well, so, 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 something had to give it, Heather. You know, I, I knew what it was like to be successful. In, you know, in, in my eyes, I was successful with, with you know, a, a beautiful wife, kids, you know, um, um, a, a good job. So I knew what I knew what it was like to be there. Yeah. Um, I, I just had to get back there, and, and and there's a big difference from being there to being in a prison cell. So yeah. obviously, in, in that time. I had lost my way, my way wasn't working anymore. I had to adapt and I had to adopt new tools and measures to get my life back on track. That's why I did as many programs and I took on uh, um, you know, as, as much advice and seeked as much mental health help as I possibly could for the day um, when I was released, I could put those tools into action and, and better myself. But it still wasn't easy, was it? When you when you got out, oh my goodness, reading the the system still didn't really support yes, yes. the level that I think it should have, which yes, means yes, it yes. isn't supporting others who don't have that strength and, and and a background to remember and try and get back. Well, is is it, is it the system or is it the is it the community? Because the system is is is. Really, they've done their job, and their job is to keep you behind those walls and, and try and re rehabilitate you while you're behind those walls. But once you're out in the community, really, is it the community's responsibility to try and help you get back on your feet? You know, it's, it's, it's almost it's, it's almost impossible to get a job with a criminal record. So that, that's another that's another thing. But if we took a step back, um, what, once I was released from prison and released, I was released to a boarding house. Uh, the boarding house was drug infested. Here yes. I am, here I am, an, a, a drug addict, you know, who, who'd been clean for twelve months because he'd been in prison. Yep. Released to a drug, a drug den. You know, so, so that was that was really hard. Um, it's like becoming an alcoholic, being getting giving a getting a job as a barman in a pub, eh? Exactly. No, no different. No, no different. Um, so, so that, so that you know, that was a huge hurdle for me to jump, and then. And then on top of that, I wasn't released a free man because I was I was on a corrections order, which 
meant I had a, you know, I had to do 380 hours community work, still a mental health uh, care plan, uh, um, a drug and alcohol care plan. I still had to see a caseworker once a week and as well as try and live. And, and that was quite difficult. And trying to but get a job. You had your so brother. I had my brother. I had that one support. And that's, yeah. that's, that's how important it is to have that one person, you know, yeah. It's really important to have some sort of support in your life. I was very lucky. You know, I've got lying about three feet away from me, um, a big golden retriever named Diego. Now, I know that for you, you had Axel in your life. Um, and then even Zeus, who came in with your friend, um, and it was in your life and the importance of having a four-legged friend. And Lully, my, my, my lovely Lully, he had two dogs in his life, his kiddos, and they were the companions that really kept him going after his wife died. And um, yeah, so yeah, who have you got in your life right now with four legs? Uh, I've got another Axel. You've got another Axel, fantastic. Yeah, I've got another Axel with four legs, but yeah. I've also got I've got I've also got a beautiful partner now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and she's got. She's got a, a, um, three girls, three daughters, um, and, and I've got my kids back in my life. You know, I've got my brother back in my life. Um, so I, I've got a good life now. I've got, I've got my, I've got a family back. You know how, how lucky I feel at Christmas time or Father's Day or birthdays to share it with the family again. I don't feel lost. You know, I, I don't feel like I'm wandering anymore. Um, I, I feel very blessed. Well, you're an absolute inspiration. No question about it. Um, and that's why I'm hoping that, yeah, start, everyone reach for this incredible book. Uh, whether you need help or hope in your life, it doesn't matter. You can still be inspired in, in whatever you're doing from reading your story. And yeah, um, that, that whole thing of hope, isn't it? clinging to it no matter when or where or what's going on and don't we need it right now yeah, and there's always light at the end of the tunnel and, and, and tomorrow is, 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 is always a brighter day you know I, I had I had, had, had given up or had I like I said had, had have succeeded um, and, and not been here today well I, I could never have, have felt like I feel today mm. Yeah. Well, I do live by, by, the, the, by the words that Lully used to say to me all the time. And, and he learned this from when he was actually in the Holocaust during, in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And he used to just say to himself every day, if you wake up in the morning, it is a good day. You just have to wake up. Because right. he never knew if he would or wouldn't. And as a result of that, I think that it's such a simple notion to hang on to, to wake up. For, for a very long time, I didn't want to wake up. For a very long time, for for at least five five years plus, I I, I wished I, that I was dead every day. You know, today I, okay. I, I I go to the doctors regularly because you know I want to live. You know, yeah. I want to live this beautiful life. I want to love. You know, I I I I I've found love again. I, you know, I've got my family back. I've got my life back. Oh, absolutely. And um, with a little bit of luck, one day we'll have our um, freedom to move beyond our borders back. Yes, yeah, that, that would be very nice. Like everything, we just hope. And uh, if it's all the same to you, I have spoken to, to Benny and uh, intend to send a couple of copies of your book to some people I met a couple of years, or less than two years ago, who I think will be inspired by your book even more. These are men in a prison in south of London, yeah. a maximum security prison, who, who read Lully's story. And uh, the warden of that prison wrote to me, he's telling me what a difference the story had made to not only these men who read it, but how they were going out and talking to other prisoners and giving their version of, of Lully's survival in uh, Auschwitz. And they were going around saying to each other, hey, there's this dude called Lully, and he was in a prison way worse than ours. And he got out and he had a good life. So maybe there's hope for us when we get out. And from that, I ended up spending three hours with 100 of these men. I sat with them in a room and let them just talk about 
the hope that they could find from others and the inspiration that they want to find from others. Uh, and it was the most overwhelmingly amazing experience of my life. You know, I've had three kids, I've got some grandkids, but when I think back and I can just go into that place so easily, you know, once I've got through all the security checks, it's, it's harder than getting on a plane, isn't it? Uh, to get into a, a maximum security prison, but just sitting with those men and yeah, yeah, they, they were naughty boys, but they were still human beings who openly wept with me and spoke to the, the man sitting beside them on these little plastic cubes. And we just talked about hope. And we just talked about what you can look for at any day in your life. So uh, they will get your book in their little library. That's great. Uh, hopefully the, the warden there will they'll let them know that it's come from me and uh, what it's about. And That's great. I, I often I often um, talk in the prisons in, in Victoria, in, you know, around home here, and, and it's the same. I speak to 100 plus prisoners at a time and, yeah. and, and I'll tell them my story and it's, it's exactly the same thing. You know, you could hear a pin drop in the room, they give you 100% of, of their attention uh, and, and, and nothing but respect. Uh, and, and they want to shake your hand. Do you think, you know, do you think I can get out of this place and not come back? And, and, I, and I say to them, yes, you can. But it will not be easy. But you can. Yeah. Don't think it's going to be, don't think it's going to be a walk in the park because it's not. But you can climb, you can get over anything. Yeah. Well, I made one mistake that day, just the one. Um, I was signing books because the publishers sent a, a hundred copies of the book there and I was signing it for some for the men that they were giving them to me. And um, it, that, gosh, that was incredible in itself because they were not asking me to dedicate it to them, but to the most significant person in their life. And so it was to their, their children and outside. And it, it, that was just amazing. And one of the, the gentlemen standing in front of me, when I looked up after he'd asked me to dedicate it to his daughter, who I think she was three or four, but he'd never met her because he'd come inside after she was born, or you know, prior to her being born. And um, I'm writing down these words and he's just saying, tell her I'm going to be the best daddy in the world when I get out. And you, you'll probably relate to that. And I looked up um, at him after I went to hand him his book and he had tears streaming down his face. I looked at him and I just said, like a hug, and he went, uh -huh. So I got up and I gave him a hug. And the, the gentleman standing beside him said, can I have one too? <laughs> and then the gentleman said, what about me? <laughs> said, oh, 20 hugs. One of the guards did finally come up to me and said, excuse me, love, I haven't touched yeah. a lady in a long time. No, <laughs> <laughs> we ended the hugs, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I get, I, I get that side of it too. Yeah, you're shaking hands, all right? I was handing out hugs. <laughs> Actually, you know, I'll, I'll give hugs too, but I'll, maybe, in a different, maybe in a different feeling, you know? Yep. <laughs> um, isn't it tremendous, the difference that not only a book, but a story, whether it's written or just told, uh, can make? And well, I think it, gives, it gives hope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you too will find yourself now being labelled a storyteller, which is yeah one of the I think the loveliest things that uh, you can be called. And like me, you've probably been called many things. <laughs> I'll I'll take being a storyteller. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I um, it's, it's something about what I enjoy doing now, uh, working with the guys and girls that are, that I work with, you know, who, who have all come out of the justice system. Um, all going through the same sort of struggles that, that, that I went through um, w w when I came out of prison, um, being able to speak their language, get down to their level uh, and, and relate, and then, and then watch them transform, um, you know, w watch them grow in coming home in a high-vis uniform and, and, and bringing home a pay packet and actually um, buying their kids Christmas presents this year instead of spending the last five years um, in jail, you, you know, um, or, or taking the kids away for the long weekend and, 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 and seeing photos of, of their campsites. 
Um, that's what I get up in the morning for nowadays. I, uh, I, I, I don't know how I ended up with, with that drive and with that passion, but, but wow, do, do I really know what my why is? Yes, I do. Yeah. Hey, listen, that's a great segue into um, talking about Fruit to Work. Yeah, tell us, tell us some more about that. Yeah, so, 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 so Fruit to Work is a, a non-for-profit social enterprise that delivers fruit and milk to anywhere from infrastructure to, to offices to factories. And, and by doing that, it creates meaningful employment, meaningful transitional employment for those who have been just by, touched by the justice system. So it creates a chance. Every dollar Fruit to Work makes um, creates another chance for, for somebody coming out of the justice system just like me. I mean, I started there straight out of jail. Nobody would give me a, a chance. And going back to jail or dying was very highly likely for me um, un unless I got that chance. So I got that chance, you know, I was picking and packing fruit at two o'clock in the morning, uh, two days a week, but it was, it was a great start. You know, I, 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 um, I, I got that job. I, I was entrusted with keys to a, to a work vehicle. I was entrusted to, with a fuel card. You know, I, I got to move out of that, that terrible boarding house and into a, um, a shared house where I could have my kids over on the weekend. And then I watched that in all our guys do exactly the same thing. I, I watch them start to get their kids back in their, in their lives. And, and you just see different people. You start to see the confidence. You see the guy who used to walk in and was unable to look at you in the eye when he was talking to you, now stares, stares at you in the eye. You know, he's all, yeah. yeah, he'll walk into work, he'll walk into work upright and, and smiling. You know, he's not scared to walk into an office anymore because people are going to label him a drug addict or a criminal because he's wearing a high vis uniform. You know, he's paying tax. He's giving back to the community, you know, and, and he's also peer mentoring the next guy who's coming into the program. But it's about you know, this hand helping the next hand up. Put your hand exactly. down, lift up, lift up. And, and, and an amazing success um, rate too in terms of the, the number of people who go through there and their return to prison or not return to prison. Yes, yeah, so, so up until now in, in, in the three and a half years that we've been running, not one person has returned back to prison. In Victoria, the rate of recidivism is 44%. So 44% of people released from prison uh, will return back to prison in the first two years. At wow. Fruit to Work, we've had a 100% success rate. Zero. Zero. Oh, look, it's brilliant. How, how's it going right now in lockdown? Uh, look, lockdown's been very challenging for us. But we've been quite lucky because we've been able to uh, to do a couple of different things. Well, normally, in, instead of delivering the fruit and milk, we've 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 merged with other social enterprises, um, and we're we're helping the community. We're we're delivering food parcels to vulnerable Victorians. We're, we're in the lockdown uh, when when the lockdown the major build the major apartments in Melbourne. We're delivering three thousand hot meals a night to, to the apartment buildings. Uh, we were putting together food parcels as well. We put together 2,000 food parcels a day um, for, for those people that were locked down in the commission flats. Um, we're also uh, delivering um, fruit and veg boxes to the foreign uni students that all lost their jobs um, while, whilst COVID hit. So we've been able to diverse, diversify the business to, to keep on going and still create employment uh, for those touched by the justice system. I can imagine too that that kind of change in who your clients, customers, whatever you call the people that you're distributing the food to, the change from it being the corporate and, and the workforce to now people desperate for anything, well, it adds a new dimension to what you're doing, doesn't it? it? It really puts you and everyone else in that we are a first responder in keeping people safe during this pandemic. And, and and on top of that, if, if, you, if you actually think about who these guys and girls are or were, including myself, people who have been touched by the justice system, yet they're on the front line, they're out there risking COVID, delivering yeah. food parcels to vulnerable people. Yeah. You know, 
de delivering uh, vegetables in bulk to soup kitchens, get meals cooked. I, I, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. I'm so proud. I'm so proud to be a part of it. And I'm so proud of the, of the guys and girls that work for us. I really am. Oh, as I say, I absolutely applaud you and everyone else involved you know, with, with Fruit to Work and, and the other organisations that are connected to it. And wow, it's, a, it's interesting times, isn't it? Because we really are seeing the best in people. And yes, we are. I see that. I mean, I know there's some rat bags out there too. I don't want to see them and acknowledge them. But right now, you've got to say, come on, Melbourne people, Victorian people, the majority of you are the best. Um, it's, it's, look, it's, 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 very, it's very tough times, but yeah, I've really seen some, some beauty in these tough times. I really yeah. have. And um, hopefully with your book, when we can get the bookshops open again, um, there's always Booktopia, folks, and uh, of course online. But uh, yes. Or click and collect. Yeah, that'll do it. Whatever. It's, um, as long as you're within your five kilometres, remember. <laughs> <laughs> so many goals <laughs> but uh, yeah look I absolutely wish you so much success I don't need to wish you success you're going to have it because you the person have told this amazing story uh, which is going to just inspire anyone and everyone who picks it up and reads it I can't not thank and, you thank you Heather and is, there, is there another book coming have we got anything else that we've well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I tell you, I've just lost about 12 kilos in a very short time. So yeah. weight there, loss. Might be a, there might be a cooking and weight loss book. You just never know. <laughs> I have a plan. You, you, you better get together with Neil and see what he can yeah. start. So, yeah. Some healthy eating and uh, yeah, healthy eating and weight loss. You never know. <laughs> well, yeah, um, because it comes back to that. People can write stories but the storytellers are quite different and, and you're that amazing storyteller. And so, yeah, don't waste your time and effort. You know you can if you want, you know, trying to write it all down yourself. Just open your mouth and talk because guess what? People want to listen. My, my, my book would never have come to light without, without Neil. You know, Neil has done a, 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 a brilliant job. I agree you know, entirely. He, he, he really relived really my story. And, and, and like I said, there, there were times there where... I looked at him and actually felt sorry for him uh, for what he had to hear um, because he looked affected. Well, you know? and you know, I can relate to that too. I had to sit and listen to, to the horrors and the evil of the Holocaust. And, yeah, uh, and, and, how did, and how did you find that, Heather? Well, I went through a period when, and I suspect Neil did too, there's this thing called transference where the pain and the trauma and yet guilt too of the person telling the story actually can transfer from them and they become a little bit lighter from talking about it, but it lands on the shoulders of the person listening. And that's what you were seeing in Neil. And that's what I felt until I could find, well, I had to find a way to deal with it. Uh, I guess it helped working in the hospital and in the social work department with those kind of mental health professionals. And it just took a colleague of mine to smack me around the head and remind me, that is not your pain. That is not your trauma. And you don't get to own it. Not one little bit. It's not yours. You can only help the person who's telling that story by listening and not wanting to own their pain and trauma. Just let them shed it. So I'm not sure if you found that, if you found through talking about it helped. Well, well, well it's, funny, it's funny you say that because when I mentor... So, so, so I go behind the walls and mentor prisoners one-on-one -on -one as well. Yeah. And, and that, that can be tra quite traumatising also because you, you listen to their childhoods and, and you listen to what's, what's happened in their lives and you, you walk out of there very drained and very affected. Oh, yeah. And, and I was having a conversation with a, a, um, a lady who works in a prison and she says what she does is when she leaves work, she picks a certain point in the road and every day when she passes that point, that's when she switches thinking about work to thinking about something completely different. And that's what I tried to do, um, even, yep. even, when, even when I was writing the book. Um, uh, and, and, and it really worked. I just tried to switch off from the story um, and think about what, what's going on at home at the moment and 
it, it was a very big help for me, that little bit of advice. Yeah, my thing was to drive around the corner into a quiet street when I left him and I would just pull into the side of the street and I'd just sit there for you know, five minutes, ten minutes, just centering myself and going, I've got a family to go home to now. I need to go home with uh, the kind of smile on my face that they are entitled to expect from me. And yeah, you, that was that time out. Interesting that your friend said that she drives and gets to a point and, and cuts off there. Um, yeah, for me, it was like to physically stop the driving after a couple of minutes and whatever it takes. You do whatever it takes. When we, when we wrote the book, I expected, uh, I, you know, I expected it to affect me to a certain degree, but I, I didn't expect, uh, for instance, when we relived the suicide attempts, actually reliving that moment, um, that, that, was, that, that they, they, they really hurt. You know, um, I, took that, I took that away with me. Um, took it away and reprocessed it. Yeah. But then you woke and, up the next morning. Yeah, woke up the next morning and, and, and was grateful that I was still here. Very grateful. So in actual fact, instead of just shoving it in a box like I did the first time, I was able to to I was able to process it. That, that's the that's the proper word. I, I processed it and um and and I, I think I've put it away for good now, which is really good. So it was probably therapeutic to write the book, you could say. Well, I can imagine it would be, and um, yeah, that's wonderful. And I just hope you write another. I don't care what you talk about and what you want to write. If it's about uh, healthy eating and losing weight, or just uh, what you're now doing, perhaps what you've now been doing during the pandemic. There's a brilliant story there. But we're going to run out of time. Okay. <laughs> Can I say, Simon Fennick, it has been an absolute delight chatting with you. Uh, yeah, I could keep doing this, but our Zoom is going to shut us down. Thank you so much for writing Breaking Good. And Thanks, Heather. Yeah, yeah, it's a knockout, guys. Go read Thanks. it. Thanks very much, Heather. Be safe. Thank you. You too. Yeah, will do. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.